Finally, on to the good stuff. We are going to talk about heat engines. We're going to finally take all these pieces that we've been putting together and build something useful that can actually accomplish something. That's what a heat engine is. So by definition, a heat engine is any device that changes thermal energy into mechanical work. Things like a steam engine or an internal combustion engine in a car. Those basically work by burning a fuel to produce heat and then using that heat to move a piston. And once you have that, you can turn a drive shaft or spin a wheel, do any kind of important, useful work. Think about how big of a deal this is, because if you know anything about engineering, you know that heat is usually considered wasted work. You want to reduce the friction in mechanical systems because friction generates heat, which is energy that's lost. Um, if you rub your hands together, there's friction, there's heat. They kind of heat up, but you can't do anything with that energy. So it was a really big deal when we figured out how to take heat and use it to do mechanical work. That's what heat engines do. So to do that, uh, you need to be really intentional about how you put together these different processes. One of the things you need to do is put them together in a cycle. So by cycle, we basically have a sample of gas in a piston through different changes in temperature. It's going to increase in volume, decrease in volume, but it's always going to end in the same place that it started. So the piston always returns to its starting location, but on a PV diagram, we also re return to the point that we started on on that graph, which means it can go through one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, and keep repeating that process over and over again to give us a sustained output of work. Next thing with the basics is all heat engines are going to involve two temperatures, um, and those are considered reservoirs or supplies of thermal energy. One is at a high temperature. That's what you get from burning your fuel source, whether that's wood, gasoline, whatever. The other one is low temperature, which is usually your, uh, your low reservoir, your waste reservoir, or some outside of the system that's going to be lower than the temperature that you're burning. Uh, some of the heat that we have from our fuel is going to be used to do work. Uh, it's never 100%. In the real world, even on paper, in, in uh, an ideal physics land, the efficiency is never going to be equal to 100%. There's always some that is wasted. But the, the idea is we can take some of that heat and use it to mechanical work. Uh, we want to get as much of that as possible. So here's a schematic that kind of shows you what's happening. Um, it's important to, to remember that we've got a high temperature reservoir, we have a low temperature reservoir, but those are also measured in terms of heat. So temperature is the average kinetic energy or average thermal energy that you're looking at. Heat is the total amount of energy that's going to be transferred from that system. Uh, so if you look at this diagram, we start with a bunch of thermal energy here and it necessarily goes to two places. First, some of it goes to work. That's what we want. We want to maximize this. That's our moving piston, energy that we can use to do stuff, mechanical energy. Whatever's left over goes to waste heat or to the low temperature reservoir over here. Let's walk through the heat engine efficiency calculation together. Uh, so like it says here, you have to know how to do this because this equation is not on the equation sheet. Uh, but a great starting point is to remember that the heat that we start with from the high temperature reservoir has to go to two places and two places only. And that's the work that's done by the engine and then the waste heat or the heat that gets dumped into the low temperature reservoir over here. So those two things always have to add up to give you the heat that you started with. Um, you can imagine we want to divert as much as we can of this original heat into mechanical work. That's the useful stuff, but we always lose some to low heat. You can never have a heat engine with 100% efficiency. Next, let's come up with a general expression for our efficiency. We'll use a lowercase e for that because this is the stuff we're starting with and this is the stuff we want. Our efficiency is going to be the ratio of the work that our engine does divided by the amount of heat that we started with. So if all of the heat was turned into work, we'd have an efficiency of one. If our work was uh, 50 joules and we started with 100, 
50 over 100, efficiency would be 50%. Some of these things are not always easy to measure, particularly this work. So if you go back to this situation up here, solve this equation, which is true for any heat engine for work. So work is going to be equal to QH minus QL. So now, uh, substituting that in down here, QH minus QL divided by QH. And if you have a fraction here, we can split that up. QH over QH minus QL over QH. This is just 1, which gives us efficiency is equal to 1 minus QL over QH. And because the total amount of heat in our low and high temperature reservoirs may be difficult to measure, it's kind of useful to know that those two amounts of heat are proportional to the temperature of those reservoirs. So we can just substitute in the temperatures instead. So TL divided by TH. And there you go. That's your um, efficiency of a heat engine. Remember, this is ideal. So this is even in a perfect world, assuming we're not losing anything else to friction and everything's functioning absolutely perfect. Efficiency still is not going to be 100% because there's always some temperature in the low temperature reservoir. The exhaust never has a temperature of zero Kelvin, which means efficiency is not going to equal one. So here's the equation that we solve. You're going to have to know how to get here. Typically, you're going to use it in terms of temperature, but it's also good to know in terms of heat as well. Also really important, not even in the ideal physics, perfect kid gloves world that we lived in with no air resistance and all that stuff. Um, even in those conditions, a heat engine is not going to be 100% efficient. Um, because QL is never going to be equal to zero. Your exhaust heat is never going to have a temperature of zero Kelvin. So you can't get this down to zero. You can't get efficiency up to 100%. Uh, ways to increase efficiency, this goes for the real world as well, is we want to make this side of the equation as small as possible because we're doing one minus this. So if we can decrease TL and increase TH, both of those are going to increase our efficiency of our engine. So how do you actually do it? This diagram shows something called the Carnot cycle, which is a loop of four thermodynamic processes strung together, which will describe um, an idealized way of showing what's happening if you have a heat engine or a steam engine that's using heat to move a piston by heating up a sample of gas, as that sample expands, it increases the volume of the piston, and then it decreases, and in that process, the moving of the piston can be used to spin a wheel, turn a drive shaft, do some mechanical work. Carnot cycle is an idealized way of taking that process, putting it on paper, seeing what processes are actually happening, so you can study it quantitatively. So we'll start at the top, and for the Carnot cycle, you should definitely know the four pieces the cycle that's going to get us back to the point we started at. So from A to B, this is the first part. Um, so we're starting with our piston at its smallest volume. Notice point A corresponds with the lowest volume that we see. So this is our piston all the way compressed, as small as it can be. And we're looking at the first part of the expansion. So as we're heating that gas in that piston, it's increasing. Uh, you can see that there's a Q1 on the diagram. That is heat that is added. Where does that heat come from? From the fuel source. We're burning gasoline or wood or whatever, and the heat from that fuel source is going into our piston and causing it to expand. That's an isothermal expansion. So from A to B, it's increasing its volume, but we're adding heat, so it's staying at a constant temperature as it expands. The very last part of that expansion whoosh, is adiabatic. So isothermal, isothermal, isothermal. And then at the very end, that last expansion from B to C happens so quickly that there isn't time for heat transfer. So it's an adiabatic expansion, which causes the temperature to decrease. So you can see from B to C, we jumped from this isotherm here 
down to a lower temperature isotherm here. Now the piston is at its maximum volume and it's gonna to start to compress. The first part of the compression is an isothermal express compression. So you can see here, volume is decreasing. Q2 is going out, so that means heat is leaving the system, uh, decreasing at a constant temperature. And then the last part of the compression is adiabatic, happens too quickly for heat to be transferred, which means there's an increase in temperature, which bumps us back up to our original temperature that we started. So the final part, D back to A, is an adiabatic compression. Temperature increases, and we're back to where we started with. So one full cycle of the piston expanding and compressing would be a cycle A, B, C, D, back to A. And that is the Carnot cycle. Cool. Another neat thing, anytime you draw a cycle, four points that make a closed loop here on a PV diagram, that's going to be one way that you could use heat to uh, move a piston. A uh, Carnot cycle with these four processes is uh, the way that you can get the most efficiency if you have two temperatures. Um, but uh, for any process, whether it's a Carnot cycle or not, the work done but in one cycle from A, B, C, D back to A is equal to the area inside this figure. So the shape of the Carnot cycle or the shape of a, a, a B, C, D, A on a graph here um, for a Carnot cycle, isothermal to adiabatic to isothermal to adiabatic is the most area we can get if we're stuck between two given temperatures. Carnot cycle. Remember the Carnot cycle is an idealized cycle that's going to give you the maximum possible efficiency if you are given a specific high and low temperature. So it's the most area you can enclose inside a figure for a piston, uh, which gives you the most work per cycle or most efficiency based on two given temperatures. So it starts with an isothermal expansion. And remember that that starts at this point up here which is when our volume is the smallest. So you can see that both for the actual piston and for the graph, that's the lowest value of the volume. For this first part of the expansion, so you can see we're at a high temperature right here, 600 Kelvin. For the first part of the expansion, the gas is gonna be gaining energy. So it's gaining heat from the fuel source that's being burned. For the second part of the expansion, that's an adiabatic expansion, and it is continuing to expand, but for this part, it's expanding um, in such a way that no heat is transferred. So as it continues to expand, its temperature decreases. So you'll see the temperature decrease, but the volume will continue to increase. That's what bumps it down to a lower isotherm. You can see here in blue. And that's the maximum volume that the piston reaches. And then as it comes around the other side, we start with an isothermal compression. So notice that that compression is happening such that heat flows out of the gas. And then finally, the last part of the expansion happens so quickly that there's not enough time for the heat to flow out of the gas. So it's as it's being compressed for that last part of the cycle, um, it's an adiabatic compression, which means there isn't time for heat to leave the gas, resulting in a temperature increase that gets us back to the original volume and the original pressure that we started with. And because we start on a lower isotherm, we also jump back to the higher isotherm. So you'll see for the last part, temperature increases, and we go back to where we started. So I would strongly encourage you to have a look at this simulation. It's linked in the notes. There are other videos there too, but it really helps give a good idea of visualizing what the process is, what's happening in each step, and what it means with a real piston. And we'll practice that when we do a lab later this week. Final note on the way out, we have some bonus coverage on the rate of heat transfer. Ordinarily, this is one of the things that we would talk about in chapter 14, but we don't have much time for chapter 14 this year. So there is one more equation from the equation sheet. 
from this fluid and thermal section that we need to tackle. And I will let you kind of take a guess here. If you look at those equations, if I didn't tell you which one was for a rate of heat transfer, hopefully you can pick it out. Boom, there it is right there. So we'll scribble that down on our equation sheet real quick. So you have it in your notes. It says Q over delta T equals K times A times delta T divided by L. So what does this mean? So Q is heat, so that's energy transferred from a higher temperature to a lower temperature object, divided by delta T, that gives us a rate, and this is gonna be something like joules divided by seconds, which gives us joules per second, or watts, because remember watt uh, is a unit of power, or it tells us how quickly work is being done or how quickly energy is being transferred. K is called thermal conductivity. That's just a constant, depends on what material you're looking at. Some things like metals are gonna conduct heat much more quickly. Some things like wood are not gonna conduct heat as well. A is the cross-sectional area. So if you're conducting through a wire or a rod or whatever, that A is the cross-sectional area of that. Delta T is the temperature difference from one side of the object to the other. And L is the length of the object that you're conducting through. So if you imagine we have like an aluminum rod here and we wanna know how quickly heat is being transferred through it. T1, T2. So the length of the rod would be L, just measure from one side to the other. Delta T would be the temperature difference. Greater temperature difference corresponds with a greater rate of heat transfer. Cross-sectional area is just the area of anywhere along that object. So in case you ever see any questions about rate of heat transfer, especially if they ask you to calculate something, uh, make sure you use this equation. It's not too bad. It's basically plug and chug, but I wanted you to know where it is.